So uh, l uh, let's jump in. Um, I'm talking about uh, um, big shock patents, uh, patents and their important role, the key role that they have served in driving not just biopharmaceutical innovation in this country for the past 100 years, but especially in response to uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, and for those of you interested, you can follow me on Twitter. Um, I do, for those who already know about this, I do on this date in innovation history where I identify anniversaries of patents that have issued on that date. So today, for instance, is a pretty auspicious one. We have three. We have uh, the, Phillips, the patent on the Phillips screwdriver issuing in 1936. We have the company that made the very first sliced bread based on the patent for the machine making sliced bread in 1928. Um, and uh, Robert Goddard uh, getting his patent on his in invention of the two-stage rocket, which is the foundation of us eventually going to the moon uh, several decades later. So, um, <clears throat> so, but that of course, those are not what we're talking about today, but you can just check out Twitter if you're interested in that. Today we're talking about the, the pandemic and patents. Now we are emerging, of course, from our very first major pandemic. Um, caused by a new virus in the modern era. Um, and the response by the biotech and the pharmaceutical industries, they, they've, they've combined in the modern era, we refer to it as the biopharmaceutical sector, so that's the term I'll refer to. Um, it was historically unprecedented. Um, you may remember yesterday, Dr. Eldaja mentioned that you know, before the pandemic, the average vaccine development time was five to 10 years to create a vaccine. Um, the fastest time a, uh, a vaccine had ever been made in history was four years in 1966 in response to mumps. This is completely blown away in the, in the COVID-19 pandemic. So the COVID-19 is officially declared to be a pandemic on March 11th, 2020. And in December of 2020, right, December 20 to 10 months later, the first vaccine doses are being delivered to patients, shots in arms less than one year, less than one year. It was incredible. And it wasn't just shots in arms. It wasn't just shots in arms. So the response by innovators in the biotech and pharmaceutical companies, it was, it was lightning speed. They mobilized in a way that had never happened before in human history, inventing new drugs, entering into patent license agreements and other commercial uh, agreements, shifting resources to maximize manufacturing and production on the basis of these patents, and ultimately deploying, as I said, at lightning speed uh, pace, new drugs and treatments. This is a screenshot of BioBio, Bio is the biotech innovation organization, the, uh, the trade group for but the biotech industry. They have run a COVID-19 therapeutic development tracker since April of 2020. This is a screenshot from it in May 12th that I took of 2020. Um, one of my first talks on the pandemic. Um, and in May of 20, so this is, this is two months after COVID-19 has been declared a pandemic, right? You have, I don't know if you can see the, oops, uh, I don't know if you can see the, um, the laser pointer. It's kind of, I'll walk up. 430, you know, they call them, you know, behind the, the scientific jargon, unique compounds, right? That's their term for drugs, vaccines, diagnostics, are under development specifically for COVID-19. Of that, 100 vaccines, 195 treatments, and 135 antivirus. This drug, uh, this virus was unknown to the world four months early before. And that's how many uh, drugs, vaccines, and other things are under development. I mean, and the impact that this had was amazing and immediate, just as miraculous as, as the development speed at which they developed their vaccines. So as of July 3rd, so I went, it's the most recently updated, um, 15.6 billion vaccine doses have been delivered to patients. So in two years, you know, since just between, from December 2020 to July of 2022, right? So we're not, you know, two years almost. 15.6 billion vaccine doses, 65%, 65.5% of the world population has received at least one vaccine dose. The entire world, right? This has never been happened before. Never, not just the speed in which they developed the medical treatments, but the actual impact, the delivery and the distribution of these vital cures that have saved hundreds of millions of lives probably. And what has been the response to this incredible innovation these incredible developments, this has been the response. 
Um, <clears throat> these, if, if you walked around DC, you may have seen these. These have been billboards that popped up starting in 2021, over a year ago, around Washington, DC. I took the photo for this one at a, at a, at a bus stop, um, but they've been in London and other places. Patents kill. Patents kill. Vaccinate our world. Patents are stopping people from being saved. And, in, and on the basis of this, there has been a real world impact as well. So immediately from the get-go, commentators and politicians were calling for the elimination of intellectual property rights, especially patents, on the development of these drugs and the development of these vaccines. One vaccine's fast, suspend intellectual property rights. U.S. supports vaccine patent waiver proposal, World Trade Organization, and on June 16th, 2022, so just last month, my birthday, unfortunately, not a good birthday present, but <laughs> the World Trade Organization adopts a waiver of all patents on, on COVID-19 vaccines under our international treaties. I mean, this is right out of Directive 10-289 in Alice Shrugged. You innovators created incredible life-saving drugs and medications, and what's your reward? We're taking away your property rights, your patents. In fact, you may remember there's a section directly on patents in Directive 10-289.3, the nationalization of all intellectual property rights. <clears throat> remember, Hank Reardon gets his little certificate with the Statute of Liberty on it. <clears throat> so maybe that's what the WTO will give pat the, the patent owners and the biopharmaceutical companies. All right, so how to explain what's going on here, all right? So, I have two points in this talk today, two points. First is, how did this heroic and unprecedented achievement occur? And even more importantly, why did it occur? Why did it occur? And of course, the basic point, which I hope to explain today and convey to you, is that innovators were free to research and create new medical treatments, produce new drugs and vaccines, and then commercially distribute them to billions of people. And they were able to do that because they had been legally secured in these important healthcare values that they had created through patents. And of course, the response to this has been vilification and condemnation, and not just from your traditional leftists. Libertarians have done so as well. Since we're in Washington, D.C., they would say, it has been bipartisan condemnation. <laughs> so um, so it, it's from all sides that they have been attacked and vilified. And those attacking the patents, by the way, are not mistaken about the facts that I'm going to talk about today. But there are many misunderstandings about patents and the role of patents in launching the response to the COVID-19 pandemic by the biopharmaceutical sector. So the purpose of my talk is to detail these facts, right? to turn the phrase from the Declaration of Independence that we heard from this past Monday, right? let the facts be submitted to a candid world. Right? And the point of this is to then arm you with these facts because you already have the moral principles to understand what, that, what the scientists and drug innovators are doing is good. And to combine your moral principles with these facts so that you can better defend them in conversations with people who are mistaken about these issues because there's a lot of misunderstandings. So the two points we're covering is that just talking about how patents facilitated the response by the biopharmaceutical sector to the COVID-19 pandemic and to understand the response, the, how and why they were attacked. I'm going to spend most of my time, of course, on the first point because that's the most important. Um, but I do want to explain a little bit of what was going on and what's been driving the attacks. And I'm sure you will not be surprised um, <clears throat> at the sources and reasons for these attacks, which are well known among objectivists. So, the little teaser maybe. All right, um, I got to come up with something to keep you here. So, <laughs> um, <clears throat> so first, the historical context. And I want to set the historical context of the long standing historical relationship between humans and viruses. And this is a very well known relationship. This is a relationship that has meant the untold, rampant, an unchecked killing of millions and millions of humans throughout our history. Viruses have been a rampage uh, 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 on humans. 
Um, just to give you a few kind of examples that you may remember from school, the bubonic plague in the 14th century, one of the most prominent plagues, right, wiped out approximately one third of the entire population in Europe at the time. 33% mortality rate. Cholera, cholera, before the 20th century, had a mortality rate that ranged between 20 and 50%. And for those of you who may remember Hamilton and other stories, there was a cholera pandemic in Philadelphia in 1793, um, in which we were very lucky that we did not lose many of the founders who were living and working in, in the city at that time. Um, and the impact would have been even worse. And of course, the last great worldwide pandemic that the world had experienced, the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918, not a lot of people really knew much about it, but it became a reference point during the COVID-19 pandemic because it was the last great worldwide pandemic that we had, had um, experienced. There weren't a lot of good record keeping at the time, especially in a developing world, but it's estimated that 50 million people died worldwide in one year, or maybe two if you wanna blend it into 2019 at a time when the, US, the entire world population was 15% of what it is today. Now to put that in perspective, the total global COVID-19 mortality rate as of, this, as of this month, as of last week, is 6.34 million. So same year and a half, two years, 6.34 million, 1918, 50 million. To give you a sense of, of the significance of the differences in the numbers, given the shift in the world population, if the same relative number of global deaths occurred today from COVID-19 as from the Spanish flu, the global mortality rate today from COVID-19 would be over 300 million people. To give you a sense of how big that is. And to give you another sense of how big that is, the entire population of the United States is only 329 million people. So it'd be massive death. And that has been the human experience with viruses for most of our history. It really was true, as Hobbes said, at least about the state of nature, right? Life is poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And it wasn't other humans that were causing it. It was viruses and bacteria. <clears throat> nature, contrary to the environmentalists, is not our friend. <laughs> and this mass death ends abruptly in the 20th century comes to a screeching halt. And the reason is the pharmaceutical revolution that brought to us all of the incredible medical innovations and cures that we all now, or most people, take for granted, as if they are just apples that grow on trees, because they haven't known anything different. <clears throat> the medical revolution that begins in the early 20th century. This follows, of course, the scientific uh, revolutions that occurred in the prior centuries, especially in the 19th century, where the scientists settled on the atomic theory of matter. And you had the development of the periodic table of elements, which allowed for more precise, scientific, rigorous exploration of chemicals and how they interact with other chemicals, such as viruses and molecules. And, <clears throat> and the very first antibiotic, that's a picture of it, developed by Bayer, and it sold eventually and released in 1932 under the trade name Prontosol. It was sulfa. So the very first antibiotic. By the way, Bayer was a German chemical dye manufacturing company, and, and they got interested in chemicals. And in fact, they thought that the, that the key ingredient was this red dye. So it was originally, if you can see, the vials are red. And it was only later discovered that the red had nothing to do with it. But people who took it turned red because <laughs> they were being dyed red. Uh, <laughs> um, great, I guess that's a great advertisement. <laughs> that red person's taking our sulfa. <laughs> so, um, and then, of course, what we do know, right? Everyone knows. A lot of people don't know about sulfa but everyone does know about penicillin. And I love this photo because what better way to make people aware of penicillin than it, it treats STDs, right? What a great way to, to get people aware of the benefits of, of penicillin, right? Uh, penicillin discovered by Alexander Fleming in 1928. Um, by the way, there was no major use of it for patients until the late 1940s. Um, and there's a partially a story about that, about patents, if you're interested uh, asking the Q&A. But this represents the pharmaceutical revolution. In fact, this period of the 1920s and 30s, there's two uh, 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 events that happen that capture this perfectly that I always love to tell when I speak to staffers and students and scholars about the value of patents and prompting and promoting um, <clears throat> uh, medical innovation. 
and that is <clears throat> in 1929, I'm sorry, 1924, I apologize, 1924, Calvin Coolidge's teenage son was playing tennis on the front lawn of the White House, and he injured his little toe. And a week later, he was dead. He got a staph infection, sepsis, blood infection, and died in a week. The teenage son of the President of the United States in 1924, because antibiotics weren't available yet. In fact, the infection that he got is easily cured now. No one almost, no one, almost no one dies from it now. 14 years later, in 1938, FDR Jr. and his mother are traveling in Germany and FDR becomes deathly ill. And his mother consents to treating him with this new drug that Bayer's making, Prontosil, and he's saved. And that perfectly captures, right, in that 14-year period, this absolute revolution in human life and the quality of our life through the development of antibiotics, vaccines, diagnostic tools like x-rays and MRIs and other types of medical saving Values. These life-saving values in medicine are launched on the foundation of patents. Patents are property rights that made it possible for these companies and scientists at Bayer and Merck and other companies to spend the years in intensive labor <clears throat> to come up with their invention and to reap the fruits of their inventive labors in the same way that the farmer has a property right in the fruits of his or her productive labors. They spend a year planting the seeds, husbanding the crops, tilling the soil, fertilizing it, and then, and then harvesting it and selling it a year later. And the property rights in the, in the crops is what makes it possible for them to do that. The same is true of in the biomedical area and any, in any innovative area. And patents are the property rights that make it possible for innovators to do this. But they're not just about incentivizing people to make these investments. This is often what a lot of people think about patents, but that's not their sole function because there are property rights. You can go into the market with them. You can trade with other people. They're called licenses where you authorize another person to use your property, your patent. It's called a license in the law. You can create complex supply chains that achieve efficiencies where one person manufactures and another person distributes and another person does the retail and the doctor is the person eventually who does it. There are all different people who are commercially transacted with each other through contracts, contracts on the basis of these property rights patents. <clears throat> so patents don't just incentivize the innovation in the first place, it facilitates the licensing and commercial development and arrangements that make possible the deployment of these life-saving values for patients and many other people. Now, if you want kind of the broader explanation of this and the justification, see my prior OCON talks, because this talk is not about that. I've talked about this at length. You can also read my articles that I've written on this. <clears throat> now, this revolution in, in the pharmaceutical industry, as it, it was known then, and by the way, this patent you can see is so issued in 1948. It's for the method of the production of penicillin invented by Andrew Moyer. By the way, this is the patent that makes it possible for penicillin to become a usable, inexpensive drug that's delivered to patients. Not Fleming's discovery. This patent is the basis by which penicillin becomes a drug that is taken by everyone in the marketplace. Um, and I'll, as I said, I can talk about that more at length, but I want to get to what happened today. Now, this is, again, very important. This is the backdrop for understanding how they were able to respond to COVID so quickly. Because the United States didn't just secure innovations in these discoveries of new um, antibiotics like penicillin and sulfa. They extended it to the, in the, to the biotech revolution. Now, <clears throat> this occurred in the late 20th century. Biotech is the application of, of computer technology to medical innovation. So instead of going out into the jungles and scooping up a bunch of goo to see if it has a molecule there that will kill a particular virus or bacteria, they design it in the lab using computers from the protein up. They use computers and other types of, of computer technology to genetically engineer drugs, vaccines, and other types of developments. The United States was the first country in the world to say these are patentable innovations. And this was a decision by the US Supreme Court in 1980 called Diamond v. Chakrabarty. Chakrabarty was, is a very famous biologist. I was honored to have met him a few years ago before, uh, before he recently passed away. <clears throat> Chakrabarty had genetically engineered a bacteria to eat oil. 
Unfortunately, it didn't work at the end of the day, but it was a new innovation, and he applied for a patent at the U.S. Patent Office, and the U.S. Patent Office said, that's a living thing. You can't get, an invent you can't get a patent on it. That's like Frankenstein. We're not going to allow this. This takes us down a horrible road. We're not going to do that. Patents are for, are for cars and oil derricks and you know, machines. And he pursued his appeal all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the U.S. Supreme Court in 1980 says, that is a patentable invention. That is a human create, newly human created value. Uh, they quoted from the uh, congressperson <clears throat> who was justifying uh, the, a revision of the patent statutes in 1952 that patents protect, quote, anything under the sun that is made by man, end quote. And that's entirely true, right? They, patents are supposed to protect any invention, any discovery of something that can be used as a value. That is the purpose and function of the patent system. <clears throat> and because the Supreme Court did this, People then understood that they would have reliable property rights to recoup their productive and inventive uh, investments and labors in the products that pro followed from that. And this is then what launches the biotech revolution in the United States starting in the 1980s. And, and there's tons of examples, but I can, um, so I'll just give only two, uh, which are fairly prominent in the literature. So the first is the Harvard Onco Mouse. I don't know if anyone has ever heard of this. Onco is short for on oncology. So this was a mouse in the 1980s that was genetically engineered to get cancer. Now, they weren't doing this because it was a horror movie or you know, something, you know, like where they were just trying to torment mice and torture mice, you know, scientists. They're so brutal. Look at their poor mice. I mean, no, this is, if you're researching cancer, how valuable is it that you are guaranteed that your animal test subjects will always get cancer every single time? Every one of them will have cancer. Imagine the efficiencies and productivity of coming up with new cancer treatments and chemotherapy and other types of, of therapy, uh, drugs and therapeutic treatments. <clears throat> and so they applied for a patent on it. And the U.S. Patent Office said, following, following the Supreme Court's decision, I said, patentable, of course. It's a human-made creation. It's a genetically engineered mice. You don't find mice in the world that naturally get cancer uh, <laughs> automatically every single time. The rest of the world refused. France, England, Germany... Um, Canada all said, no, this, is, this takes us down the route of Frankenstein. This is not right. This is improper. This is patenting life. This is patenting things. We are doing things that they shouldn't be doing. And it wasn't until the late 1990s that most of the other countries in the West had finally conceded begrudgingly to patenting biotech innovations like this. Of course, and that in, in, uh, during that same time period, Innovators knew in the United States you had reliable and effective patent protections for any genetic engineering that, uh, uh, products, any products from genetic engineering that you wanted to create to benefit humans and to pursue research. <clears throat> and so investment capital flowed to the United States. And, and the United States became literally the birthplace of the biotech revolution. And this is exemplified by Genentech. Genentech today is a multi-billion dollar company. I think its market cap, when I last checked, was about $24 billion. Genentech was the very first successful biotech startup. <clears throat> its first innovations, as you see, uh, was genetically engineered synthetic insulin. Synthetic is just a fancy term for genetically engineered, human-made, um, so not found naturally. So before this, the way that they got insulin to treat diabetes was from pig pancreases. So they used to just have farms where they would raise pigs and then harvest the pig's pancreases to, to get the insulin to treat di diabetics. Now they could manufacture it. They could produce it like any other product. Incredibly effective and incredibly important from turning diabetes into a manageable day-to-day -day condition that it is now instead of the death sentence that it was for millions of people throughout most of human history. <clears throat> and responsible for dropping the price and the cost of, di of, of insulin. And then, and then also their other big innovation was the synthetic, uh, synthetic growth hormone for children. So the result, as I mentioned, of these types of uh, companies and innovations is the biotech revolution occurs in the United States, which is really interesting because if you may remember your history, right, the Industrial Revolution starts where? Not in the United States. It starts in England. But it shifts to the United States for many reasons. And one of them, as I've explained in prior talks at Ocon, is because we provided more effective and reliable patent protection for the innovations that were being created during the Industrial Revolution, we see the same type of, uh, of development in the biopharmaceutical sector. Remember, I said the pharmaceutical revolution starts in Germany, 
with German chemical companies that are creating dyes like Bayer and Merck, right? Bayer, the creator of Prontosil, and you also may know Bayer because of aspirin. They, invent, they invented aspirin or discovered it. Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> but by the mid to late 20th century, it's all occurring now not in Germany, but in the United States. Two thirds today, two thirds of all new drugs and medical treatments are invented by US companies, two thirds. 13 of the top 20 most innovative biopharmaceutical companies are US companies. This is a revolution being driven by the United States. And the real world impact on human life is undoubted. We are no longer, as a result of this, ravaged and killed in the tens of millions by viruses, especially new ones. So you heard yesterday Dr. Adalja talk about um, the, the MERS. Uh, virus that emerged in 2012, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus, and SARS, the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome virus that emerged in 2003. Both of those people were concerned were going to become pandemics, and they had a lot of reason to be concerned. MERS had a mortality rate of 35%. Uh, SARS had a mortality rate of 14%, still very high, very significant. Modern medicine prevented both of those from becoming pandemics. But even when viruses become pandemics today, as we have witnessed with COVID-19, they have a substantially less impact. Remember I told you MERS had a mortality rate of 35% and SARS had a mortality rate of 14%. The estimated global mortality rate for COVID-19 is 3.4%. And that is a long tail distribution, which means it's not a perfect bell curve. It impacts a very small, uh, particularly a very small segment of the population. And what is that segment of the population? The elderly, people with compromised immune systems, and people who have comorbidities. If you have these three conditions, your mortality rate can be 30% or higher. But if you're younger than 50, you are healthy, and you have no comorbidities, you have a very, very low mortality rate. The CDC mortality rate in the United States for COVID-19, if you are aged between the age, if you are anywhere between the age of one and 25 and you get COVID-19, the mortality rate is 0.01%. This is all a result of drug innovators right, being secured in the discoveries and inventions that they have come up with that have created the modern healthcare industry and modern healthcare treatments for humans, not just in the United States, but worldwide. <clears throat> and this is the foundation. This is what was in place. This is the technological and commercial context. When COVID-19 emerges from China in late December 2019 and early January of 2020, at that point in time, you had had hundreds of billions of dollars that had been invested over decades. In fact, I would go so far as to say trillions of dollars that had been invested over many decades in creating not just new drugs and new treatments, but a commercial infrastructure and a knowledge base that made it possible for the biopharmaceutical sector to leap into action and to respond to COVID-19 in a way that we had never seen before. The amount of private investment in new drugs is astronomical. In 2018, just that one year, which is the last year we have data for, private companies invested over $129 billion in the research and development of new drugs and therapeutic treatments. Now, I'm emphasizing this because what you often hear, especially with the COVID-19 vaccines, is, well, the government paid for that. Right? This just came from government scientists or government monies. So this should just be, this should be free and people shouldn't be profiting from this. That is not true. It is not true that all drugs and other medical treatments are created solely by public funding from sources like the NIH or other government funding sources. I mean, you can ask me in the Q&A about this. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I want to emphasize that is not true, either about new drugs generally or about the COVID-19 drugs in particular. Of course, uh, as you heard yesterday, the cool, new, exciting development that we had 
uh, in the biopharmaceutical sector in response to COVID-19 is the mRNA vaccines, right? And thanks to Dr. Aldalja, I don't have to spend too much time talking about mRNA as a technological platform. He described it really perfectly well, right? It's a basis by which you can do lots of things, right? And lots of cool new things. Um, he talked about Dr. Caitlin Carrico, right? Just a pioneering genius and hero, right? Um, she's now involved with Bionitech, as you heard, um, one, of the, one of the companies that created, one of the, uh, along with Moderna, one of the two mRNA vaccines, right? Um, she was a pioneering genius, right? And, but the consensus in the 1990s and all through the early aughts was this can't be done. mRNA is too fragile. It's not permanent. It's not stable. It disintegrates in the cells eventually. And so you just can't use it to make vaccines or other, or other types of medical treatments. And so she couldn't get grants as a result of this. And you heard a little bit from Dr. Ajalja. She was mistreated at the University of Pennsylvania. They moved her desk into the hallway. <laughs> they wouldn't let her even become a full professor and things of this sort. Um, and so the, so the way in which this got driven was through private venture capital financing in startups like Moderna and Bionitech through private investments. We have patents on these technologies. We are going to develop new products and, pro uh, and treatments and invest in us, and you'll return, you get a return on your investment like you do in investing in other startups. Now, I will acknowledge there were some scientists at NIH who worked on aspects of the basic research. You heard about that last yesterday from Dr. Aldalja. But patents still served a key role in that process because the NIH researchers got a patent. That was how they transferred that information through a license agreement to Moderna and to Bionitech. So patents still serve a fundamental key role in the commercialization and deployment of these inventions and discoveries into the real world for the treatment of diseases. Now, there's also some ongoing disputes because there's overclaiming by NIH. Moderna is currently in a legal dispute with the NIH right now about whether an NIH scientist should be identified as a co-inventor in one of its patents that it has on its mRNA technology. And it's really impressive how Moderna is fighting this. They are, they are taking a very strong moral position that we invented this, the scientists did not contribute to the technology. They may have contributed to some of the basic research, upstream discoveries, but the actual technology that we invented at Moderna and deploy as a vaccine is ours and we created it. In fact, Moderna has been an incredible company. They've been unapologetic about their innovation, their creation of it, and their right to profit from it. At a Senate hearing last year, um, where the representatives from Pfizer and Moderna and Biotech were all brought before the Senate, and the senators asked them all to pledge to make no profit on their vaccines. And they got to the Moderna representative and he said, absolutely not. He said, we invented this, we have a right to profit from it. It was, just, it was amazing. You don't hear that often, right, uh, from people who defend themselves in those strong terms. Um, and, you know, of course, the senators went crazy and the press went crazy, and they stood their ground on that. It was fantastic, right? But the fundamental point is, right, that, that public grants and public uh, scientists uh, working public money played a relatively insignificant role ultimately in the, in the final development of the mRNA vaccine as we now know it today. It was through private venture capital financing and startups like Moderna and Bionitech that made it possible for them to create the vaccines, right? Venture capitalists making investments, just like venture capitalists invested in the startups like Google and Microsoft and others on the basis of the property rights and their innovation, right? And this is then what it made it possible for Moderna and Bionitech and many other companies to leap into action. In early 2020, you had a massive commercial and technological infrastructure that had been created in the biopharmaceutical sector that was based on trillions of dollars in investments over many decades, but at least 40 years going back to 1980. And the scientists and companies leapt into action. As I said at the beginning of my talk, and you heard yesterday, the average time for vaccine development was five to 10 years, right? <clears throat> and before COVID-19, the fastest vaccine that had ever been created was four years. Chinese scientists released the genome of the, of the virus that causes COVID-19. It's known as SARS-CoV-2. They released the genome for this virus on January 26, 2020. Do you know how fast it took Moderna to make their vaccine on the basis of that genome? Does anyone, this story is often repeated in the press. 
two days. You often hear that. Moderna made, and that's true. Moderna made a vaccine in two days. Do you know how fast BioNTech made their vaccine? You don't hear this very often. Two hours. Two hours, from five to 10 years to two hours, right? Both of their vaccines were delivered to the Food and Drug uh, uh, Administration uh, in early 20, February of 2020, one month before COVID-19 had even, even been declared as a global pandemic. Before even COVID was a pandemic, they already had and were testing at the FDA two vaccines for it, right? And the vaccines, therefore, were not given to patients until December 2020, not because of research and development or companies dragging their feet, as you often hear accusations of, but entirely due to the regulatory approval process at the FDA, the safety and efficacy testing that they, are, that they uh, mandate. Um, so it was not the biopharmaceutical companies that prevented people from getting vaccines earlier. Um, it, was, it was the FDA. <clears throat> right. Now, it wasn't just that they were able to quickly create their vaccines. Because they also, because they had to deploy it. They had to manufacture it, distribute it, you know, get it into the hands of doctors. And this is what came out of, of this massive commercial infrastructure. This is a schematic of the licenses. Remember, licenses is the term of a contract between two people over a patent. So you can use my patent. We call that in patent law a license. Um, a license of just the mRNA vaccine. So this doesn't include AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson. So each of these little colored circles is a patent or a group of patents. And you can see you have, unfortunately, the, the, the laser pointers, you can't see, you see the Moderna there, right? You have Moderna. You have the NIH, that one patent up there that, that Dr. Adalja mentioned. Um, you have BioNTech, UPenn, because that's where Dr. Carrico worked. Um, <clears throat> okay, even Tesla <laughs> uh, in the top corner. And every one of these lines, except for just a couple which represent lawsuits, are license deals between these various uh, uh, companies approving and sharing their technology and, and, and their property rights with other companies to quickly deploy these, these products into the marketplace, right? So you see Moderna licensing with UPen through uh, mRNA ribotherapeutics through UPenn. You have the NIH um, <clears throat> the, with the spike protein. A patent application that Dr. Adalja mentioned going to Moderna from NIH up there you see at the top. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Adalja also mentioned CureVac. But if you added in then also the, all the massive numbers of commercial deals of other companies and Pfizer uh, or uh, beyond just uh, Johnson Johnson and AstraZeneca and others, this would be, this would be spaghetti, right? Um, <clears throat> you know, of course, the most famous deal, in fact, is the deal between, and you can see Pfizer's down there at the very bottom, I don't know if you can see it right there, at the very bottom under BioNTech. And that's the most famous deal. Everyone probably has heard of the deal between BioNTech and Pfizer. You don't take the BioNTech vaccine, you take the Pfizer vaccine, although it was invented by BioNTech. BioNTech enters into a license with Pfizer. Why did BioNTech do that? Well, BioNTech was a small startup. They didn't have a lot of capital, a lot of money, a lot of people, or commercial infrastructure. They didn't have manufacturing plants or anything. What they had was innovation capital. They had the invention that they created in two hours. So this is what you see happen. This happens all the time in the biopharmaceutical sector. Small startups license or are purchased by larger companies like Pfizer, Merck, Johnson & Johnson, because they then have the capital and people and money and, and, <clears throat> and facilities to scale up very quickly. And this is how you very quickly get new drugs and new treatments from these new startups through these commercial exchanges between startups and the larger companies sharing their respective expertise and, um, and, and, uh, and capabilities with each other. But there are a this is just the mRNA vaccines. There's tons of deals that aren't even on here. So Pfizer and BioNTech then license Novartis and Sanofi to manufacture their vaccine doses to make their vaccine doses, use their manufacturing plants. Johnson & Johnson licenses Merck to manufacture its COVID-19 vaccine. AstraZeneca licensed the Serum Institute of India to manufacture its vaccine, which is not mRNA-based. It's a tra more traditional uh, vaccine, as described by Dr. Adalja yesterday. Right? And by the way, these licenses, it's not like these are new. As I mentioned, these types of licenses deal are, pa are, are par for the course in the modern biopharmaceutical sector. 
Remember I mentioned Genentech, which invented, you know, invented synthetic insulin? Massive, incredible discovery or invention. Um, well, they were a startup in the early 1980s. So they licensed with Eli Lilly to manufacture and distribute their synthetic insulin. <clears throat> right? Now, to capitalists, right, this is all unsurprising. You're saying this is what people do. They go into the marketplace. right? This is what it means to have property rights. The farmer doesn't sell the crops directly to you, the consumer. The farmer sells it to a job, what they used to call a jobber in the 19th century, you know, middle person today, right? the distributor, the wholesaler. They sell it then to the retailers, right? and so on and so on. This is the division of labor, which achieves economies of scale, which is what allows for the fast, efficient delivery of new products and services in the market. Place, and this is as true in the biopharmaceutical sector as it is in any other area of, the, of our modern economy. You also had a massive shifting of existing resources in the biopharmaceutical sector. It was very similar to the shifting of industrial capabilities during World War II, you know, where Ford stopped making cars and started making tanks. Um, and so, in fact, in May of 2021, uh, the Moderna CEO, Stephen Bansell, was quoted as saying, quote, there is no idle mRNA manufacturing capacity in the world. This is a new technology. You cannot go hire people who know how to make mRNA. These people don't exist. Air, I mean, they were literally, this is not hyperbole, manufacturing at 100% capacity. There was not more they could do. And not just the mRNA vaccines, all of the traditional vaccines from AstraZeneca and Johnson and Johnson and others. And the result of this, all of this commercial activity, is this. In 2021, right? remember, first doses delivered in December of 2020. So from January of 2021 to December of 2021, 12 billion vaccine doses are actually produced in the world. Do you know the world population? It's only 7 billion people. <laughs> this is almost double the entire world population. And vaccine doses in 2022, conservatively, are estimated to top 24 billion. 24 billion. In fact, there's so many vaccines being manufactured now, there's now a supply glut. There's now a glut. In November of 2021, South Africa halted all new deliveries of vaccines to its country because they said, we've got warehouses overflowing with vaccines. We can't accept anymore. They're going bad. They're not being used. Right? And in April of 2022, the Serum Institute of India, the one that licensed with AstraZeneca, they halted all production of COVID-19 vaccines for the same reason. They just had, our warehouses are overflowing with vaccine doses. We don't, you know, they're just going to go bad. We need to stop making this. Right? Um, and in fact, this is, remember the, 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 May, tw uh, the May 12th bi uh, bio uh, COVID-19 uh, tracker? So this is the tracker as of June 25th, 2022. So almost two years later, right? Almost double the total number of drugs and vaccines in various stages of research and development, right? So if you remember back to the earlier slide, there were 430 total compounds under active development, right? Two years later, 854. Almost half of all of these drugs and vaccines that are under development are by companies based in the United States, 415 of them, 415 of them. Um, by the way, this, this web page is more than just this. It's this incredible breakdown of all of the data and statistics on this stuff. It's absolutely incredible. And you have to do screenshots because it changes every day. <laughs> the numbers keep going up, right? This is a dramatic example of the power of the human mind and of capitalism and literally saving millions of human lives. This is, you remember Dr. Leonard Peikoff used to talk about truck-like concretizations of abstract principles. You know, that you make an abstract principle so real, it's like a truck rushing at you. There's just no doubt about it, right? Right? This is the truck-like concretization of how patents protect the productive labor of innovators and that through the freedom of capitalism and the free market, they produce values in producing, licensing, and otherwise commercializing and selling these innovations in the marketplace. And that this is the life-saving function of capitalism. This is what it means when we have pharmaceutical, private pharmaceutical companies investing privately for their own profit to come up with new innovations. And of course, what's been the response to this, as I mentioned at the start, vilification and condemnation. And the attacks were immediate. Now, this is more important than the attacks. So I'm leaving this slide up while I just talk about and describe and quote some of the attacks. I don't want to give the, the people attacking them any more acknowledgment than, 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 than just the bare necessity. Um, and I literally mean the attacks were immediate. 
February of 2020, right? So this is a month before COVID is declared to be a pandemic, right? This is just a couple weeks after Moderna and BioNTech have delivered their vaccines to the FDA. In February of 2020, 46 Democrats write a letter to the Biden administration telling them that any patents that are issued on COVID-19 vaccines and treatments should be immediately confiscated by the government. And then two months later, in April 2020, four senior Democratic leaders in the House of Representatives announced their principles for the COVID-19 pandemic, in which they state that the federal government should impose either price controls or outright confiscate, again, any vaccines or drugs to treat COVID-19. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said it is the, quote, moral imperative, unquote, of our country to ensure that those who need COVID-19 vaccines and drugs receive them around the entire world. Right? <clears throat> uh, and by the way, this is before there are any drugs or vaccines, right? So they're already announcing this, right? You don't even have these numbers yet, right? In fact, you saw this. They acted on this, too. So the very first drug to treat COVID-19 was remdesivir. I, I hate the names that biopharmaceutical companies come up with their drugs. <laughs> They're so hard to pronounce. There was a great meme where they said, here's a list of names. And guess, are these names of elves in Lord of the Rings or names of new drugs? <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it was perfect. <laughs> um, right? Remdesivir, which is approved by the FDA for treatment of severe respiratory symptoms caused by COVID-19 infections. Immediate calls for the confiscation of remdesivir um, by the federal government. Um, uh, Remdesivir was, uh, was a drug, his patent was owned by Gilead. To give you context of this, Gilead, a scientist at Gilead had labored for more than a decade. And ultimately, the company spent more than a billion dollars in R&D creating this drug. It was originally invented to treat Ebola, and it was a failure at that. It didn't success, successfully treat Ebola, so they put it on the shelf. They said, it's done. And when COVID-19 happened, they took it off the shelf. They said, well, COVID-19 is also a respiratory infection. So let's see if it works. And it did. It worked, it worked incredibly well for sev the severe respiratory uh, symptoms that some COVID-19 patients get. And the attack on them was immediate under, uh, by US officials calling for them to be confiscated. Um, <clears throat> luckily, those actions weren't taken. But the threat of them was significant. And people were worried. Um, and I was writing op-eds and engaged by, uh, in the policy debates um, here in DC defending Remdesivir's patent um, against these calls to, to, to impose price controls or to confiscate it. But the attacks have not just been domestically in the US. The attacks have occurred internationally as well. Internationally as well. As I mentioned at the very start of the talk, there was a meet, there, there, the, the World Trade Organization, um, which, is a, which is a unit of the United Nations, which is the mechanism by which we uh, enter into a lot of our treaties, our international treaties, our uh, trade-based treaties, um, uh, has been debating for two years uh, to waive intellectual property rights on COVID-19 treatments under our international treaties. As you heard me mention yesterday in the panel, IP laws are domestic laws. They're, they're only apply in the nation state that enacts those laws. You have a US patent, or, an, or a British patent, or a German patent. Um, <clears throat> and we have treaties to try to facilitate respect for each other's patents, um, to help facilitate the global innovation economy. And, um, <clears throat> and just uh, three weeks ago, June 16th, 2022, for the very first time in human history, uh, the World Trade Organization adopted a waiver of all patents on vaccines under our international treaties. Now, the original waiver proposal actually was worded to waive all intellectual property, not just patents, copyrights, trade secrets, all intellectual property that related to any discovery or technology that could be used potentially in the treatment of COVID-19. So you have like a trademark on an, on an app, potentially, to test people for COVID symptoms. IP rights would be waived on that, for instance. Right? Now, the justification for this alleged waiver that they were at, de, de, insisting on and the, that the WTO has adopted uh, last month, well, we have to speed production and access to COVID-19 treatments. This is why I'm keeping this up here. P, you know, there's not, enough, there's not enough drugs. There's not enough vaccines. We, we have a mor remember Nancy Pelosi's words? We have a moral imperative to ensure that we have as much made and as much people to access this. Again, here's the gimmick in that argument. Just like with the, uh, the proposals by US politicians, this waiver proposal 
was first made by the countries South Africa and India at the World Trade Organization in October of 2020, before there was a single vaccine that had been delivered to patients. Remember, the first patient to receive a COVID-19 vaccine was December of 2020, right? <clears throat> um, so before there was a single vaccine available, uh, approved, or I should say approved for treatment of patients by government regula regulators in any country, they said patents and intellectual property rights are blockading access, they're blockading development of this, we need free access, we need to open it up because we need to speed this to happen. It hadn't even happened yet, <laughs> and they were already doing this, right? By the way, Note, remember, I said South Africa started to refuse deliveries of new vaccines in November of 2021 because they had too many, right? This didn't stop them from continuing to agitate for a waiver of, of patents and other IP rights on COVID-19 vaccines up through their successful uh, uh, lobbying for this at the World Trade Organization in June. In fact, India and South Africa have always opposed patent protections under international treaties. They played a key role in efforts to waive intellectual property rights for AIDS treatments uh, um, throughout the 1990s and early aughts after the turn of the century. So why are these dates significant? Because what it reveals to you is that this is not being driven by the facts, right? This is not about any factual uh, concern rooted in evidence that we have not enough production of vaccines or drugs, and not enough distribution caused by patents or other I, uh, uh, um, IP rights. What, what is this an example of? Well, this is an example of what Ralph Emanuel, Chief of Staff for President Obama, infamously said during the financial crisis in 2008. You may remember this. He said, quote, you never want a serious crisis to go to waste. And what I mean by that is an opportunity to do things that you think you could not do before. And that he was talking about TARP and all the other things that the government had, federal government had uh, enacted during the Great Recession that began in 2008. What was even worse, though, about what happened at the World Trade Organization is that the President uh, uh, Biden officially announced U.S. support for the waiver in May of 2021. This had never happened before. The United States has been a leader in respecting intellectual property rights throughout the world. And many countries have actually modeled and copied their IP systems on ours, <laughs> including now even China, as I mentioned yesterday on the panel. Um, <clears throat> and this was a significant signal to the world that the United States was no longer going to stand up to the, for the rights of the innovators and creators who had made modern, uh, our, our, our modern lives possible that we live, uh, that, that, that we live today. Um, the person who was re uh, responsible for negotiating at the, US at the World Trade Organization on behalf of the United States is, is uh, official known as the US Trade Representative. And, and in the Biden administration, her name is Catherine Tai, and she gave a speech at that time where she said, and remember Rahm Emanuel's quote, right? She said, quote, extraordinary crises challenge all of us. And then she went on, quote, there is still a gaping divide between developed and developing countries when it comes to access to medicines, end quote. And she said, quote, we saw this during the HIV AIDS epidemic, where various policies and actions constrained access to medicines contributing to unnecessary deaths and suffering. We must learn from and not repeat the tragedies and mistakes of the past, end quote. Now, that is all 100% factually false across the board. There is no delay in manufacture, production, or distribution of vaccines or other drugs caused by patents or other intellectual property rights. And notice, by the way, she just accused the biopharmaceutical industry of causing unnecessary deaths and suffering in the AIDS epidemic, the very industry that has people live today because we have treatments for AIDS that, that didn't exist when AIDS first came about. What is really driving this is not any alleged need to speed access to drugs and vaccines. What is driving this is exactly the words that Nancy Pelosi used, a moral imperative. And what is that moral imperative? What is the moral principle represented by that imperative? Remember what Catherine Tai said. 
there is a divide between developed countries like the United States and Europe and Japan and, uh, and other advanced economies and developing countries, which is now the new term for what we used to refer to as the third world. Right. In other words, there are people who need drugs and we have a moral obligation to give it to them because we have them. We are successful. This is the moral principle of altruism and its implementation in political action, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. We've created the vaccines and drugs, and now not only should you not profit on it, as, as all the company representatives were asked not to do, but you have a moral imperative to give up your property rights, to give up your IP rights, to ensure that other people have easy, fast access to these life-saving medications that you have created. <clears throat> this is the significance of the COVID-19 pandemic beyond just being a pandemic, is that it gives us dramatic concretization of two opposite philosophical approaches to human life. Right? On the positive side, you have the power of the rational human mind, the life-enhancing values that are made possible by free people secured in the rights to life, liberty, and property. And, and among those property rights, intellectual property rights, their patents. Right? The result of that philosophy right, is unprecedented achievements in science and industry that were literally inconceivable, and I'm not being hyperbolic there, literally inconceivable 100 years ago, and still considered impossible just 20 years ago. The creation of a vaccine in two hours. 26 billion doses of that vaccine that was of that vaccine manufactured worldwide in two years, right? More than four times the entire world population, right? This is stuff that was thought, uh, people couldn't even conceive that, let alone, uh, you know, 100 years ago, at the, just the start of, you know, Prontosol and, 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 um, and, uh, uh, and penicillin, and still thought impossible even 20 years ago. Of course, on the negative side, Right? You have the role of altruism and collectivism in our country and internationally. Right? And this really is a case of facts be damned. Right? This is James Taggart, remember? Don't bother me, don't bother me, don't bother me. Right? Um, <clears throat> in fact, just yesterday, uh, two days ago, I was speaking with a U.S. Uh, a biopharmaceutical representative who participated in the discussions in Geneva at the World Trade Organization. And he was expressing to me extreme frustration at how th they were open about this at the WTO last month, that they were saying, we recognize that this waiver is irrelevant and unnecessary in the COVID-19 pandemic. And that why are, we, why are they pushing for it? Because they know there's going to be another emergency, another pandemic, and they wanted to set the precedent for not having to wait two years and to create the precedent in under our international treaties that we can do this, we will take from the innovators and creators, and that we will do this with the sanction of the United States for the very first time in history. Innovators are explicitly being punished for being good, for producing, for achieving, and saving lives. And their reward for this from our politicians, our government, and from international organizations is their life work is stolen from them and they are condemned as murderers by politicians. Right? Now, I don't wanna emphasize that anymore because the positive concretization of what freedom and patents can achieve is so much more important, right? It's so much more important. The mRNA platform is the long awaited promise of the biotech revolution that began four decades ago. I don't know if you guys have heard this. I think Dr. Adalja mentioned it. Pfizer is now testing a universal coronavirus vaccine. By the way, as he, as he may have mentioned, and I like to emphasize this, the common cold is a coronavirus, right? And we all know the classic phrase, there is no cure for the common cold. That phrase is about to become you know, <laughs> obsolete, extinct. Um, uh, and they're not just testing a, uh, uh, a vaccine for coronavirus, uh, universal coronavirus. They have now begun trials for an mRNA-based AIDS vaccine, 
and an mRNA-based malaria vaccine. I mean, think about what those will do for us uh, and do for humanity in the, way, in the same way that we have wiped out cholera and smallpox and the bubonic plague and other types of diseases. As with earlier revolutions in medical care, the, anti the antibiotics revolution in the very early 20th century with sulfa and penicillin, and then the diagnostics and new drugs and genetically engineered treatments that came with the biotech revolution in the late 20th century, we are on the brink of a massive revolution in biotech that will massively increase the quality and quantity of human life. And that is the truck-like concretization of what Ayn Rand meant in that profoundly deep and significant sentence that she uses to start her essay, Patents and Copyrights, in Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. I love this sentence. Quote, patents and copyrights are the legal implementation of the base of all property rights, a man's right to the product of his mind. Of course, she would, that's her opening sentence. <laughs> uh, you know, and for, for the rest of us, that's pages and pages of having to think this through, right? And that's the point, though. Rand gave us the intellectual tools to understand the significance and meaning of what we just witnessed in the biopharmaceutical sector of the past two years and the moral principles to appreciate and value what that means in our lives today. Thank you. All right. Now the fun part. So, <laughs> all right. Amazing talk. Thank you very much. Uh, do I remember correctly, or do I understand correctly, that uh, in the area of distribution of the drugs, which is not you know, uh, directly IP area, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm sure you will know something about that. Do I understand correctly that the distribution was not normal, you know, market, not normal sales to the public, but only solely through the governments, right? In the US, US government and elsewhere through the local governments around the world, governments around the world. Uh, I think this was wrong, but that's not the, the my point, that's not the question. Oh. <laughs> the, 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 the question is, did any of these companies like Pfizer, Moderna and so forth, you know, you mentioned that at the recent hearing only Moderna stood up against, you know, you should give up profits and everything. Are you aware that if any of these companies would uh, themselves try to uh, sort of dissuade the government, no, you know, we're not going to do this through you, we're, yeah. you, know, uh, we're, you know, we have the right to distribute it ourselves and so forth? Yeah, so, uh, so uh, some great points and a good question. So um, for those of you who don't know, right, so, um, or you may not know this, right, the, the no private company in the biopharmaceutical sector was given a choice about how the vaccines were going to be distributed. The government stepped in and said, we are going to buy them. We're going to do all the distribution. We, we are doing everything. You don't have to, so they weren't allowed to go into the market. So Pfizer and BioNTech, they weren't allowed to say, hey, do you want to buy a vaccine from us? That was, they were legally prohibited from doing that. The, the, the federal government and every government in the world took over um, the, uh, the, the, the purchase, the advanced purchase, and, and continuing purchases and distribution of this, which led to a lot of delays. You may remember in early 2021, there were tons of articles about you know, vaccine, the, it, you know, delays in the distribution of vaccines because they were following these kind of set regulatory requirements of who could get them and under what categories, and there were vaccines sitting unused in various places and hospitals and things of the sort. Um, and, and by the way, this is people then point to say, well, look, the government's bought all these vaccines, so we paid for this, so you shouldn't get any money from this, right? The biopharmaceutical companies weren't given any choice in this matter. Um, now, they don't really have the, the, you know, they can say to the companies, I don't know if they did say to the governments, you know, hey, we would like to try to do this privately. Um, but, um, but I don't know if they d did do that. I do know that, that they, there was a lot of pushback from the biopharmaceutical companies, especially when, the, the World Trade Organization negotiations were becoming 
serious. You know, it went beyond just like this is a crazy proposal to this is a proposal that they're really going to pretend adopt, especially when the United States announced it. And the Pfizer CEO issued an open letter shortly after uh, the Biden administration announced its support for the waiver in May of 2021, where he he went through, look, there the causes of why there, you don't have uh, mass distribution of vaccines in the developing world has nothing to do with patents. It's, in, in, it's a whole array of regulatory and legal barriers. So the Trump administration and the Biden administration both invoked the Defense Production Act, which legally prohibited the export of any materials necessary for the treatment of COVID. So like PPE, legally, you can't export it. And this was really significant because the United States advanced purchased uh, about, I think, 10 million doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine, but then the FDA didn't approve it. They found that it didn't have effic uh, sufficient efficacy levels to be used by patients in the United States, but it was approved for use in 70 other countries. But because of the invocation of this law by both Trump and the Biden administration, these vaccines sat unused in the United States. They were not distributed. Um, and other countries did the exact same thing. It, it went under the t name vaccine nationalism. I don't like that term, but this became a concern that people were talking about. Notice, not about patents, right? It's about regulatory and legal barriers. Also, um, this, in, in the Pfizer CEO also mentioned, this is very revealing, he said, I personally called leaders in de con in, uh, of developing countries and said, we will ship to you for free, right? The vaccine, right? You know, we're not going to charge, you know, twenty dollars a dose, which is what, uh, uh, which is what the U.S. paid, uh, you know, to you know, citizens, you know, the citizens of Rwanda. You know, we'll just ship to you the vaccine. Um, and I don't know, but he didn't name the country, so I'm just using it as an example. And he said, I was repeatedly told by many government leaders, this is a new technology, this is some we untested, we don't know anything about it, we don't want it. We think this is dangerous. And he says, this, so this is nothing about patents or intellectual property holding up anything. It's all your classic examples of just regulatory blockades, legal blockades, uh, what's called vaccine hesitancy, you know, you know concern about vaccines. Um, and also, by the way, it's also really mundane things like lack of distribution infrastructure in the developing world. You're a, you're a developing country in a, in, a, in, a, in a tropical climate. You heard yesterday, right, that, that these vaccines have to be kept at sometimes negative 20 or negative 70 Celsius temperatures, right? These are places where they don't have roads, let alone refrigerated trucks or freezers to distribute vaccines to, you know, small villages way out in the countryside. And those are the reasons why you don't have worldwide distribution of the vaccines and the vaccination rates. It has nothing to do with that. In fact, the reason why we have so many of these vaccines that are sitting in these warehouses in South Africa and India and so many other places is because of these problems about lack of distribution infrastructure. And we've been hitting on that again and again and again. I've talked about that. Others have talked about that. But it's been making no headway because those are facts that they don't care about because it's not about the facts. It's about it's about the moral imperative of altruism and the political uh, mandate to implement that, which means to punish the innovators, to punish the people who succeed, not actually take the action necessary to address the real causes. Yeah, great, great question, yeah. yeah. We have a question from the online chat. Oh, great, yeah. Uh, from Mark, can mm -hmm. you please provide the website from which you took the screenshot of the COVID pipeline analysis? Yeah, so it's called, if you just Google bio COVID-19 therapeutic development tracker, or just co bio COVID-19 tracker, it'll, it'll be the first thing you hit. <laughs> but um, but I, uh, I can provide that as well, um, and it can be sent out by the, uh, uh, by the, uh, uh, by the um, people. And I'll put it back here. I'll put the title back if you want to put the screen back on, if you could put it back up. Yeah. Um, so if you, uh, if you, Oop, I cut off the title there. If you, if you do bio COVID-19 tracker, do you, that's all you need to do. That's what I Google every time. <laughs> then I go to it uh, to you. find out what the information is. All right, yeah. One of the slides you showed was a, a 1948 patent application for distribution or use of penicillin. Yeah. And I, if I read the opening paragraph right, it said that the U.S. government has the right to use this patent without any charge. Is that standard in patent applications? No. <laughs> um, and I'm sorry, I, 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 um, that's not standard in patent applications. Um, let me, uh, the, 
what, what you have is that the U.S. government, because of the takings clause in the Fifth Amendment, where it says, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation, that it, since patents are property, the government can take patents, but they have to pay for it. Um, and, and there's a process uh, through a, uh, a, a law called Section 1498, where you sue the government for payment when they take your patents for use by the government. Um, so, you know, the, and, and the government has done this a lot. Um, in fact, there are numerous cases from the 19th century um, and up to the 20th century that I teach when I teach patent law and that I've written on where the courts have said the government, where the government has just taken patents and hasn't paid and the patent owners have to sue and you get these great statements by judges saying, you know, patents are property rights like any other property right. There's, they are, they are, you know, secured under the Constitution like any other property right, and they should be protected under the Constitution like any other property right, um, which, is a, which was a very unique, for those of you who know my speeches from, uh, from prior years and my writings, that was unique. We were, the all, we were the first and only country to actually take those positions about how we viewed patents and other types of intellectual property rights like copyrights, which are in our Constitution, um, as property rights. Um, and protected them as such, as opposed to being monopoly grants or special privilege grants from the crown or from the sovereign. Now, um, that patent is also really significant. So it's a patent on the method of manufacturing. And so that, was, so that was the discovery of how to mass manufacture penicillin in a way that therefore you achieved economies of, of, of scale, right? So you make a lot of it, prices drop, it becomes a more affordable drug. And, um, and I'll take your question as an opportunity to comment about the patent connection with Alexander Fleming. So Alexander Fleming, as everyone knows, discovered penicillin. It was an accidental discovery. He left a, a, a dish of um, bacteria in his, in his, in his, uh, in, in his kitchen. And, and then he came back, and there was, then the bacteria had, had died at, uh, in part of the Petri dish. And he, and he investigated what was in the Petri dish, and what he found was eventually penicillin which is a mold that had come in through the window. Um, and Alexander Fleming said, I'm not going to patent this. I'm going to give this discovery to the world. Um, I don't want to have property rights. No one should have property rights in this. This will save the world. This is 1928. Well, as a result of his decision not to patent it, no one learned about it. Because one of the functions of patents, as, as for those of you who know about patents or have ever seen a patent like the one I put up on, on the slide, is that they are, they are published like they're and available to anyone to look at, like your title deeds at the local county recording office when you own a pop, pop, parcel of land. For the same reason, anyone can go and look at the registry of patents and learn from them and figure out, oh, there's this new invention and I want to use it, so I should enter into a, a deal with this person. I should figure out how to enter into a license agreement with them or to experiment off of it and to build off of it and to invent another type of uh, version of this, of this drug or another type of uh, a machine or a more advanced version of it. Um, this is one way in which patents promote the spread of knowledge and the spread of, of science and technology. And th a, there are a lot of economists and, and scholars who now believe that the delay in the ultimate um, use of penicillin worldwide from, because as I mentioned, penicillin goes effectively unused from 1928 until about 1944 where the US government starts to use it in lieu of sulfa um, in, um, in World War II. Uh, for those of you who've seen World War II movies, especially older ones, you know, when a guy gets shot and you're medic, medic, and the guy comes and rips open a package and is sprinkling this white powder over the wound, that was sulfa. Um, and that revolutionized um, uh, medical treatment, um, even before penicillin. In fact, um, the first wartime use of sulfa uh, was in Pearl Harbor, because it just by happenstance that the Pearl Harbor, the naval station there had received a massive shipment, or I'm sorry, wasn't the, the uh, a doctor who was promoting the use of sulfa and was supposed to speak at a conference had come to Hawaii to give a speech, and he had brought with him a whole massive quantity of sulfa samples to distribute to local doctors. And then when the Japanese attacked the next day, he went to the local hospitals on base and said, I have this stuff, use it. And this is one of the reasons why only 3,000 people died at Pearl Harbor. Because for those of you who know the history of military conflicts, the majority of deaths are not caused by actual combat deaths. They're caused by infections from wounds. Um, and this is the very first time, World War II was the first time in human history where more people died from actual combat deaths than died from infections caused by injuries in the combat. Um, and so they could have used penicillin, much more powerful, much more effective. 
than sulfa, um, but they didn't know about it. And, 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 it was, and it was wartime, so the US government said, we're really interested in this, but because no one had been developing or experimenting with it, it was very expensive to make, which is, so the US, the only institution that could have the amount of resources at that time to really invest in it was the, the federal government to start mass producing it for soldiers, because it would have been way out of reach of your average person in the cost of production. And it's that patent by Moyer, uh, which is what make, is really responsible for penicillin becoming the penicillin we now know. It's not Alexander Fleming's discovery of penicillin. It's Alexander Moyer who's really responsible for us now thinking of penicillin as the foundational antibiotic that, that we all know it to be. So, yeah. Hi. So there are quite a bit, quite a number of more free market leaning scholars and thinkers, notably Matt Ridley, for example, who actually argue against patents on the basis that, and they doc document series of events or examples where patents seemingly delay the spread of innovation or of production, right? So do you think that in all of those cases they're just simply wrong and there is something wrong with their analysis? Or maybe it's the case that in terms of how patents are protected by what institutions in what political respects, like this is all intertwined with politics that maybe historically or even currently there are issues with how not uh, in terms of the processes, not in terms of that patents as such may, yeah. be, may be the reason. Yeah, it's a great question. By the way, I did a book event with, with uh, Matt Ridley okay. at the Hudson Institute. I, I am chair of the Forum for Intellectual Property there. Uh, it's the Hudson Institute. It's just a uh, think tank here in DC. Um, you can Google it because it was done uh, online. Um, you know, Adam Mossoff and Matt Ridley, Hudson, in Hudson Institute, um, and I push him on, back on some of this. Um, and I spend a lot of time debating libertarians um, and, and many others who think that patents are monopoly uh, grants from the government that impede innovation. Um, a lot of the claims that they make, historical and otherwise, are actually not true. They're based in conventional wisdom. That's a myth. Um, I debated a libertarian at the start of the pandemic on uh, whether patents are, would be benefit for the, you know, the response to the pandemic. And he, he brought up the, you know, the Wright brothers allegedly held up airplane innovation. And, and, there, and there's an historian who looked at that and said, that's not true. Claims about how um, uh, the, uh, James Watt allegedly held up innovation in the steam engine. Father one historical and legal research has proven that's not true. You have all these little kind of historical chestnuts that people point to that ended up not being true. And it ends up really being that they're deducing from, uh, from a theoretical conception in economics of what property rights do. Um, so a lot of libertarians and economists start from the premise that property is the solution to scarcity. And, and because when you have scarce resources, there's fights over how to use those scarce resources. So you need a way for someone to say, no, I have a right to exclude you as a basis for, to, to, for people to transact and things of this sort. Um, that Ayn Rand's re, uh, response to that argument, and my response as well, is check your premises. It's not that there's scarce resources. It's that the basis of property is not scarcity. It's value creation. It's, the, it's because there are no, oil was not a scarce resource in 1800, right? It, when does it become a so-called, quote, scarce resource? When it becomes a value in human life. When, it bec when you have the invention of uh, 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 combustion engines, you have the industrial revolution that needs oil and fuel and things of the sort. It's just, so, uh, it can, so it's a deduction from a theoretical conception of the role of, econo uh, of property rights um, in economics that they're primarily working from that's, uh, that's not, that doesn't actually reflect the actual source of property, which is what Ayn Rand's point is. It's the, it's the values created by the rational human mind. It's value creation, which is the basis of property. And this is why you have property rights in airwaves and in credit and in all sorts of things where there's no physical scarcity um, because those things have been turned into, into values. And insofar as they're turned into values, they're property because of the person who turned it into a value. A value is what one creates and acts. It acts to create in a life and it serves a life. And that's what makes something property. And the property right is the protection of that value in society against other people. Um, so that's kind of a quick summary. I've given a bunch of talks on this. If you just Google my name, a bunch will come up. <laughs> um, I also wrote the chapter on intellectual property that just came out in the recent uh, Rutledge Companion to Libertarianism, where I describe 
various arguments for and against intellectual property among those who are broadly frank called libertarians. Excuse me. Thanks. And, um, uh, and, I, and I identify you know, the natural rights arguments, the economic arguments, the natural rights arguments for intellectual property and against, and I'm just describing them. Uh, the economic arguments for and against, and Ayn Rand's argument um, for <laughs> uh, intellectual property is kind of the key arguments. And, um, and, see, and, and as I said, I just described them, and there's a big bibliography in there as well. So. But also check out the, check out the, um, uh, check out the, uh, the, the, um, the discussion I had with Matt Ridley. It, it was really good because also Matt starts from a, a, um, also a mistaken premise that a lot of people do start from, which is the point of intellectual property is to incentivize people to invent. We have to get people to invent. So we dangle this little carrot in front of them called a patent. And that's the sole role of patents. And if you remember back to my talk, I said, no, that, that's part of it, right? You, you tell a farmer they have property rights in, in the fruits of their labors. They're going to farm. They're going to be incentivized to farm. But you can incentivize people to invent with all sorts of things. You can have prizes. You can have public grants, like what the NIH gives. You can tax subsidies. There's all things that people kind of come up with. But why patents? Because patents do something different that none of those other mechanisms do. Patents are property rights. Because it's not just about the invention. It's what you do with the property right. Your ability to go into the marketplace, use it as collateral, license with it, embrace the division of labor with other capitalists to achieve the efficient production and manufacture of this new innovation. Patents are the bridge that converts an invention in the lab or the garage into a real world product or service, an innovation sold in the marketplace. None of the other uh, prizes don't do that, and tax subsidies don't do that. None, none of the other systems do that, which is why patents are so successful, and why the United States was so unique, and why the United States was so successful, and why patents were such a foundational pillar to the success of the United States with the Industrial Revolution. This is my talk last year at Ocon and the prior year before that where I identify all of the great industrialists and innovators in the 19th century who, ba who, were about, who worked on the basis of their patents. Yeah. Sorry. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Sure. Um, I work in a clinical testing laboratory where we awesome. use... Um, thank you. <laughs> we do um, rapid RNA COVID testing, which is um, developed by Abbott Laboratories that was developed from their already existing uh, rapid flu testing. And I was just curious, um, even though it, the COVID testing was released under an emergency um, authorization, mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if, because it's the same shared technology, does this, even though it was released for emergency situations, does that still, um, is that still included in their original patent for basically the exact same product? Yeah, so the, um, so the patent isn't the same thing as what's approved by the regulatory officials at the FDA or in other agencies of the government. The patent just covers the invention, however it may be used. And, the, and so to the extent that the patent is, is, a, di is a, pat a patent on a diagnostic testing technology, it doesn't matter if that technology is used for the flu, it's used for COVID, it's used for anything else. And in fact, so this is this, one of the significant values of patents. They often discover, hey, this one invention really works well doing something else. <laughs> but the patent isn't about what it treats, the patent is just on the initial discovery or invention, right? So you discover oil, and oil can be used originally for trains, and then automobiles are invented. It's not like you have to get a whole new property right in the oil for the use of the oil for cars, now, now in addition to trains, right? So, um, and, it's, and, and it's the same with regular inventions. And there are some great, uh, 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 hist uh, you know, uh, stories of, of inventions being discovered, like, oh my god, this has a whole other use. Um, so, um, for instance, um, uh, um, so Prozac, uh, which is the drug to treat depression, uh, the doctors discovered that people taking Prozac also started not being, having such desires to smoke. And, they never, and so they did some further investigation, and they found that there's a nicot that, that the drug active ingredient in Prozac suppresses the desire for nicotine. <laughs> And so, you, so I forget the name of the, the drug that it's sold under um, that you can take to s suppress your desire for nicotine. But that's, that's Prozac. <laughs> um, and there's tons of other examples of that. And it's, and it's just a great example of how pat, you, know, the, you, know, you come up with a property right in a piece of land, right? And you can say, well, I might want to build a house on that, or maybe a factory. Or maybe I'll build a first a house, but then it'll become more valuable as a factory down the road. And that's your choice as a property owner. And that's the exact same principle that's protected 
for owners of patents. Um, and again, that was the United States approach because the original approach in England and many other countries was, no, 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 this is a grant from the crown to you personally for just this thing and only this thing. And if you want anything more, you got to go back to the crown to get permission. And by the way, it's a grant to you from the crown, so you can't give it to someone else, right? You know, when the, you know, when King George gives you this, you know, you can't say, oh, I'm giving King George's gift to someone else. There's no regifting of, <laughs> from the crown, yeah. So, um, and this is what drove the U.S. innovation economy and in the Industrial Revolution and in the 20th century, too. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. Uh, what do you think about the idea of patent, so-called patent trolls who acquire a patent and then go and try to sue creators of new inventions. Do you think that's a real problem? And if so, what can be done about it? Yeah, that's a great question. Every, you know, and it, it shows you the power of, of, um, of PR and, uh, campaigns by very large, well-funded companies who get sued a lot for deliberately infringing patents. That everyone knows this term, almost everyone knows this term, patent troll. Uh, uh, and, you know, they're aware of patent owners uh, in ways that they're not aware of or knowledgeable about other types of technology owners or other IP right owners. Um, so it's a massive uh, you know, PR issue uh, in part of the policy debates for about 15 years. Um, are there some people who abuse patent rights? Of course, because there's some, are there some people who misuse property rights and land, right? Is there you know, the classic old man who takes out the iron pipe and chases the kids down the street, oh, get off my property, right? You know, does he have the right to do that? No, he doesn't have the right to threat, physically threaten someone, right, just because he has property rights and land. Um, and because, you know, uh, this is the integration of rights of liberty and life with property. And so are there a few people who, potentially, who have, a, you know, uh, uh, you know, engaged in bad behavior in some way, shape, or form with that? Yeah, a few, yeah. But is it, is it a real problem? No. Um, and this was a creation, actually. I've been in, deeply involved in these debates for the past 10 years. Um, you know, the, and the problem with the patent troll term, ultimately, is that it's non-objective. When you push people, how do you define it? First, they'll say, like, well, it's someone who doesn't manufacture. And you'll say, well, Thomas Edison never manufactured. Is he a patent troll? Oh, no, no, no. Well, no, he wasn't a patent troll because he's a great Thomas Edison. So, oh, it's someone who buys a patent. Oh, uh, so... Tesla bought patents. Was he a patent troll? No, no, no. Tesla's great, so we don't know. I don't want to condemn him. All right, well, so, no, it's someone who, does, who maybe, okay, they, or they invent, but they don't manufacture, oh, so like universities? Which, by the way, has Edison been called a patent troll? Yes. Has Tesla been called a patent troll? Yes. Have universities been called patent trolls? Yes. And this is already showing you that there's a problem with this term, right? And, it's a, and what is it? Is it's an attack on the patent system. It was a term that was created in, the, in, the, in political policy debates in D.C. starting about 15 or 20 years ago um, to weaken the patent system um, by attacking people who purchase and license patents, which, by the way, as I told you, was a key function of how patents serve to drive innovation and commercial development in our economy and in creating new products and services. We want that to happen. We don't want people who have a patent to have to manufacture we want them to be able to sell their patent to someone else, just like you can sell your house or you can sell your business. Or we want you to license to someone who knows something better than you. Like Charles Goodyear is a patent troll by definition. Charles Goodyear, the inventor of vulcanized rubber. He was a crazy inventor. He didn't want to manufacture. He just wanted to invent stuff with rubber. He wrote a two-volume book on all the uses of rubber. He just said, you can use it for ships and for shoes. And for, he just listed out all the uses. Right? So he licensed his property right to other people to manufacture it because he wasn't good at manufacturing. He didn't want to manufacture. He wanted to be an inventor. And that's what we want. But that's what patent, the patent troll rhetoric condemns. And so you can see how it's a really sneaky term. It uses a few, you know, a couple bad examples of bad actors, but then universalizes. This is a huge problem, and we need to address this, and we need to weaken patent rights as a result of it. And, um, and so be very skeptical of uses of it when you see it, is my, rec is my recommendation. Hello there. OK. So you mentioned that in the beginning of the talk that on June 16th, they made it so that you can't get a patent on a vaccine like COVID-19 mm -hmm. so that people can get it sooner. But how does a patent stop vaccines in such a way that it affects people so much they need to ban them? And if it doesn't, why do people waste their time on it? 
Yeah, that is a great question, right? <laughs> so, um, and, the, and, and it is, the argument is, well, you, if you have a patent, you can stop someone from using something because that's what the point of having property is, right? If you have a property right in a house or let's say your bedroom, right? That means you can say, no, don't come out, right? You can put the keep out sign on your front door because you can keep someone from using your property without your permission. And this is, so they deduce from this, they will say, no, you can't use my property, saying no to all these people who want to manufacture or use the property, uh, make vaccines, right? And they will do so for, because there's no real good answer for why, because the whole point is, of course, they're going to want people to manufacture vaccines. They make money doing that, right? So, um, but the argument is that having property, as you and I have talked about, right, means the ability to keep people away from something, keep out, right? It's yours. And so the idea is, well, there'll be grumpy companies that won't let other people use their uh, uh, vaccines or use their drugs, and, uh, and thereby limit the number of drugs and vaccines that could be made. But as you see, oops, not, it's gone. <laughs> uh, the slide is gone. But as you saw in my talk, right, that's just not true. It doesn't happen because that's not really what happens with patents in the real world. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, guys. <laughs>